In Africa, every morning the cock crows to make it known it's time to arise. Every morning, somewhere in Africa, we arise to celebrate the sunshine and give thanks to the Almighty. That morning, somewhere in Africa, the lion rises. <laughs> The lion runs, it runs, runs faster than the fastest antelope in order to eat. That morning, somewhere in Africa, the antelope rises. It has to run, run, run faster than the fastest lion in order to survive while enjoying the circles of life in the jungle. 2020, the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife was inundated with running and surviving the COVID-19 pandemic while celebrating the privilege to be in the profession. We, the nurses and midwives, made the world a better place with the sacrifices and dedication to our profession. I am because we are. The Ubuntu spirit was felt in every facility. Today, we say thank you for the continued service of, to humanity. Siakwam Kela, Professor Julia Blitz, Sekela, Dean Lezemfundo, Quicadelo, La Mayenza, Nempilo, Estelenbosch University. Welcome, Professor Julia Blitz, Visa Diakan, Leer, and Onderach in the Fakutet, Kenyaskunde, and Hasontet Vietenskapa, Universitat Stellenbosch. Welcome, Professor Julia Blitz the Vice Dean, Learning and Teaching in the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, Stellenbosch University. Good morning and welcome, greetings from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, it's wonderful to have you all here today. Um, as you all know, and I don't need to remind you, the World Health Organization decided to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Florence Nightingale's birth by declaring 2020 the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife. In celebration of this, a collaborative partnership between Stellenbosch University and the South African Medical Research Council brings you this webinar with the theme Engaged Citizenship, the role that nurses and midwives made to combating the COVID-19 pandemic. Last year, we would not have imagined that 2020 would bring COVID-19 to the world. And once again, this has shown the pivotal role that good nursing and midwifery play in any and all healthcare systems. Without a well-trained, knowledgeable and committed cadre of nurses and midwives, our country's responses to this pandemic could never have been able to achieve what they have. Following due protocol, I would like to welcome the following eminent participants in today's webinar. Firstly, Minister Norma French in Bombo, the Provincial Minister of Health in the Western Cape Province. Professor Hester Klopper, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Strategy and Internationalization at Stellenbosch University. Professor Glenda Gray, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the South African Medical Research Council. And online, Professor Amina Goga, Director of the HIV Prevention Research Unit at the SAMRC. Professor Yunus Ndirangu, the Dean of the Aga Khan University School of Nursing and Midwifery, East Africa. Professor Lydia Asiato, Dean of the School of Nursing and Midwifery of the University of Ghana and Professor Portia Jordan, Executive Head, Department of Nursing and Midwifery at Stellenbosch University. Last but not least, I'd also like to warmly welcome all of today's webinar guests, wherever you may find yourself in the world. Welcome, Mwamkele Kile. I know that this panel of women scholars are about to treat us to a fascinating and erudite exploration and celebration of the role of nurses and midwives in the COVID-19 pandemic. Just to say, and I will thank her again, that the next speaker is Professor Doreen Kaura of the Department of Nursing and Midwifery at Stellenbosch University, 
and I'll hand over to her. Thank you. <laughs> the idea is to provide a, Western, a West African perspective, a East African perspective, and a South African perspective of the 2020 International Year of the Nurse and Midwife by providing an overview of, the, of what we contributed to the COVID-19 pandemic and getting rid of it. Welcome, Professor Lydia Aziato. Prof. Aziato is the Dean of School of Nursing and Midwifery in the University of Ghana. She has been a nurse for more than 20 years with a specialty um, in oncology nursing. She holds both local and international positions in nursing organizations such as Sigma Theta Tau International, among other organizations. Lydia is a fellow at the African Science Leadership Program, as well as the West African College of Nursing and a foundation fellow of the Ghana College of Nurses and Midwives. She has published in many credible international journals, peer-reviewed journals, as a, and is a reviewer of many. Her area of expertise is, is pain, cancer, and women's health. Welcome, Professor Aziato. Unmute yourself, please. Thank you very much, um, and uh, good morning to everybody, wherever you find yourself. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share from the West African perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got given five minutes, so I'll be as brief as possible. We all know that um, this year, being the year of the nurse and midwife, we were looking forward to, you know, celebrate ac ac across the group. But then COVID, um, should I say, made all of us, I don't know whether we are surprised or it has really brought forth the importance of nursing and midwifery and has also showed us the yes. fact that nurses and midwives are really the backbone for healthcare services. So if you go to Worldometrics, um, you find the statistics of COVID in the West African terrain. But I, I just tried to bring a few of the West African countries and the status of COVID uh, as we have it uh, as at yesterday. Uh, I, got the, I took these figures yesterday. But within the Ghanaian perspective, I just want to say that um, our association is very vibrant, is on the ground to fight for nurses and midwives who are infected. And then there's a, a, an insurance package for them. So the uh, statistics on nurses who are affected is very up to date. As we speak, we have 800 nurses that have been infected with COVID since um, it started. Majority of them have recovered. Unfortunately, we lost two of our nurses. Um, so if we look at the recovery rates across Africa, it's very good. But then um, once we have death, even if it's one life that has been lost, it is still a great loss to that family, to that individual that has dependents. So for me, whether it is one, is two, or it is hundred, a death or a death is not to be acknowledged or should be expected in the health sector. So we have lost some lives, unfortunately, to COVID in the West African terrain, um, like Cote d'Ivoire, uh, one, two, one deaths, Cameroon, uh, four, two, three. And I think that this is worrying. And as nurses and midwives, we should do something about it. So I um, was asked to bring forth some contribution and challenges of uh, nurses and midwives in that sub-region. Um, so generally, the nation or the healthcare system fell on nurses and midwives to do education. So radio education, TV education, um, in all the languages that nurses and midwives can speak. Um, these have been going on since the pandemic started. And of course, we had some trainer of train, trainers for the staff um, and that is still ongoing. And we have a lot of community group-based uh, outreach programs as we speak. Nurses and midwives, especially the preventive uh, nurses, have been involved in case detection. They've been involved in contact tracing. 
They've been working in that isolation centers and treating our infected uh, clients. You find some of our colleagues at the various airports and harbors, um, various triaging centers, various hospitals, and we have some facilities that have been strictly dedicated to coverage um, treatment. So we find nurses and midwives who have been trained working in these areas. Um, and those of us who are in academia have also done some research um, on this COVID. Um, some have submitted their manuscript under review, and some of us have also been involved in policy development issues um, within the sub-region. However, um, I find that... I can't hear my word, it can always work. May I go on? All right, so I find that some challenges that we have encountered include the fact that, you know, some at the time, the pregnant women, those who have just delivered, were asked to stay at home, and therefore the few were extremely exhausted. And because when we had a lockdown within the sub-region, uh, cars were not working, so those who lived far away found it difficult to go to work. Therefore, nurses who lived close or within the hospital premise were taxed to hold the fort, and that was really exhausting. But now it's a bit okay because um, transport systems are ongoing and everything is a little okay than before. But when it was at the peak, it was really scary. And a few nurses and midwives who were at posts were really uh, very, very exhausted. I mentioned the infection rate. I mentioned the, the deaths already. So within the sub-region was also the stigma um, of fear and isolation people nobody wanted to do anything with you because they were afraid that they will become infected so the mental stress separation from families because some people were not coming home they had a place for them to stay so when they were off before they could go home to so limit exposure to their family members and that resulted in a huge human resource challenge from there for the health sector so I, our students who were on study leave, who were nurses, were all called back to work. And um, it was really challenging at that time because we also had to organize our end of semester exam for them. They had to go back to work and all that. At that time, we all know that it was difficult to come by PPEs and uh, West African sub-region was also affected. We didn't have the adequate PPEs to go around. Because of that, our students were not asked, allowed to go to the clinical area. All clinical placements of students were put on hold because even the regular staff were not getting adequate PPEs at the time. And so that has brought forth the need for us as academics to think about how can we teach nursing and midwifery online? How can we use virtual and reality teaching platforms to make sure our nurses and midwives get the necessary skills before they qualify as nurses? And I mentioned that the five minutes I want to stay within it. So in conclusion for this short presentation, I want to thank everybody who has listened to me. And I would want to say that from where I see my lens say that for all of us as nurses and midwives, we will continue to discharge our duties to safeguard life. And I'm sure that we'll continue to be at the forefront of whatever it is that come as a pandemic or whatever threat comes to the health system. Nurses and midwives within the sub-region will continue to contribute their quota to save life. So thank you very much for your um, attention. Thank you, Professor Aziato. Uh, we do appreciate the presentation. Um, in the end, we will have uh, Q&A questions. So please prepare to ask um, the questions from the region. Sure. Next is the East Africa region. And uh, Professor uh, Eunice Durango is somewhere between the flights. So um, we had to, um, Professor, um, Ms. Edna Telam, 
kindly agreed to represent East Africa. And Edna Talam is a national leader in transforming Kenya health systems through regulation of nursing education and practice. She's a keen business, she has keen business credentials and hands-on experience in developing national health policies. Edna is currently the registrar and the chief executive officer of the Nursing Council of Kenya. She oversees the management and administration of the Nursing Council Kenya functions in training, registration, legislature, standards of nursing practice in accordance to statu statutory requirements. Welcome, Edna Talam. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Doreen. And uh, I'll be taking you through what are the fears, uh, challenges, and also accomplishments for the nurses and the midwives in the region in combating this COVID. So to basically start with that uh, stressful events around the COVID-19 pandemic is really on the rise. And of course, nurses and midwives are really not immune to anxiety and fear. And in fact, they may be able to suffer higher rates of fear uh, among them. So they really feel stress, which is an experience that uh, the nurses and midwives are experiencing at the moment. There is fear, fear of becoming infected and infecting our families, our loved ones, working as a frontline healthcare worker. And you can imagine after a shift that you start to wonder that shortness of breath, that headache or another fake symptoms is anything uh, basically to worry about. And that also goes towards the um, fear of self-isolation from family members and also the community. Uh, because of also our resource-constrained environment, we also have fear of getting infected because of the shortages of the PPEs. And of course, possibility of having the huge numbers of people infected, putting a strain to our resources, especially the critical care facilities. We also worried uh, with dealing with huge fears, huge numbers of deaths as seen and encountered by our other colleagues in the region. And of course, fear of being really getting overwhelmed with the situation. Uh, the other fear, again, is basically that all these things can lead to the mental health issues among us. And you can imagine uh, coming in a daily shift and you encounter 100% mortalities. Imagine your own colleagues dying, you know, your own boss, your own people that you really treasure. This is a reality of the disease and we really fear to, for us to be able to reach there as a region. Uh, the other also is financial situation. Uh, we've been able to see how this lead and um, that again might really be able also to pause in regards of our remuneration package, which we don't so much earn much, but at the same time we go beyond our call of duties. Um, the other fear is the fear and loss of trust in the health system, that the people, the public, we really lose trust within ourselves and within the COVID-19 response, which will be only address the needs of the people that we are, and that is where we are really fearing on the second wave of this infection which are coming on. The challenges that we've experienced in the region and the workplace is uh, not limited to inadequate PPEs, long working hours, shortages of healthcare workers, especially those who are trained for the respiratory support and also critical care units, because we've seen a lot of immigration and also uh, uh, we are few within our, our healthcare system. Inadequate also uh, infrastructure and health systems, uh, uh, facilities to be able to manage these uh, surging numbers of COVID-19 and also lack of adequately equipped quarantine and isolation facilities. At the same time, again, most of us are the challenges at the moment our citizens really don't follow the directive and guidelines issued by the respective Ministry of Health and, um, and also WHO, and this overwhelmed the system and also the spread of the virus. Uh, we also seen a bit of challenges on closure of some critical health facilities, especially in the initial stages, and again, uh, restrict the access to health facilities in the communities as we move on. Poor and also low access to essential health services due to the containment measures um, the, uh, in other regions in the countries where we had curfews, which could co which really contribute to the movements within the region. And uh, within the private sector, we've also seen um, some of the nurses and midwives really uh, being uh, losing their jobs or taking pay cuts because of the issues of the financial constraint which we are able to do. But at the same time, as we talk about the challenges, we have a bit of accomplishment that we really pride on as nurses and midwives. We've seen high rates of recoveries through the efforts made jointly within the nurses and midwives and also the healthcare team. This is the most important time that we've really seen a bit of a lot of teamwork and a lot of multidisciplinary approach within ourselves. 
We have also been on the lead to develop and adopt implementation of guidelines protocols for COVID-19 pandemic. And in particular, in the Kenyan health sector, we were leading on based uh, guidelines to be able to support this. And of course, our proper and timely sensitization through the media. We've seen our nurses, our midwives going, uh, taking the lead to be able to give the advocacy messages on our online platform and also using the multidisciplinary approach. The, the nurse-led leadership and also raising the profile of the nurses has really been something that we have really been able to accomplish as a profession, where we are really taking the lead and ensuring that what is to be done, the IPP protocols, and again, reflecting back to the primary healthcare models on that. Uh, consistent communication by the relevant ministries within the region on the reporting of the COVID. And this has also contributed to control the issues of in infodemic associated with pandemics, as we have seen. We have uh, at the same time, again, mobilized resources from private sector, multi-agency and international bodies. The region uh, quite received a bit of donation to be able to support this. And the telemedicine in the management of COVID-19 patients within the country. As we also reflect on the innovative strategies the nurses and midwives has used to engage with the emergency care and dealing also with the community fears, uh, the nurses and midwives have been able to uh, adopt these innovative strategies. And this is basically more of a team approach with the other healthcare workers where we have redesigned existing model of care and we've taken the lead in management of these COVID-19 centers where we are able to be able to establish um, the best practices in standard operating procedures, how in, in IPC protocols will be implemented. And we've also taken the lead in implementing the own based care guidelines, which is really a success story, uh, more so in the region that I come in, which is Kenya. We have reinforced the task sharing model, and again, gone back and reflect on the primary healthcare model. And going back to the basic issues of IPC, the basic things of hand washing, which should be able to support our primary healthcare model as we be able to progress. We've used the community-based platform to create demand for healthcare services. And at the same time, we have also supported and ensured that there's consistency in setting up of hand washing station with strategic service delivery points for all clients. And this really uh, is more of the NAS-led um, managers within the respective institutions to ensure compliance and implementation is done. E-learning platform for capacity building and utilizing it consultation and sharing experience. For the last six months, I've seen a lot of capacity building, a lot of consultations within the, uh, the nurses, within also the region. And we've come up as a region to be able to be able to sharing the best experiences, how we can be able to really model and see how we can have this as a success. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a bit of fears and again challenges is issues of mental health. We do not want to underestimate the psychological support and the mental health. For example, the Nancy Castle of Kenya really has spearheaded the Zumba for nurses and midwives in the region to ensure that they relieve the stress and they support them. At the same time, again, the associations has also been able to work and have this psychosocial support mechanism to have this to be able to do. Advocacy is something we do not want to uh, uh, underestimate, part of the innovative strategies where we work with the family members to understand what is COVID disease and again, release the anxiety. And more so, we have changed the narrative. We are the one to be giving them success stories of recovery and hope rather than demystifying issues of the deaths. And in this changing narrative, we have also proved to be a trusted profession and have this niche at this particular time where our health seeking behaviors, where we provide assurance and necessary measures to be put in place for continuum of care to those already having comorbidities and addressing the issues of the NCDs. Uh, as I go, to um, the reflecting on us, on those who became in and also who succumbed to the COVID-19 and we wish to really acknowledge their efforts. The midwives and nurses are first line for defense in healthcare system, including pandemic. We are in the forefront of the healthcare systems. And as a result, they became ill and others really succumbed to COVID-19. We really want to thank our respective states within the ESC region for the special recognition of these fallen nurses and midwives, our heroes and heroines. I would like to commend and recognize the amazing work that they've done, who have raised above the rest to care for those who are infected and again, time dealing with long working hours and cues to assist them. They are the patriots. We are at the war and we are the soldiers. We salute all the nurses in the front line of COVID-19 
we want to thank you so much for your commitment in combating this pandemic. And indeed, we celebrate you as our heroes and heroines. As we finalize again, what is the investment then necessary to enable the nurses and midwives to function effectively? Investment in educationary training is something that we really need to be able to put focus. Investing in it should be able to lead us and give us a triple effect as we be able to manage this COVID and also post COVID as we move forward. Investing in the supportive environment, having adequate protective preventive equipment and having workplace strategies that maximizes the contributions for the nurses. Within the job sector, what are the incentives? Could we want to be able to reflect and see how we can also invest in the incentives, in the promotion, in the redesignation, and again, employment within the healthcare workers in totality? We really need to see how we can maximize their contribution and how we can be able to have that potential that they have, that we have not been able to utilize it. We also want to also to um, also uh, see how we can all invest in the infrastructure and adoption of the technology. We have seen about the telemedicine. My colleague has mentioned about the virtual teaching, the virtual reality, that it can really be able to improve our services. What are the training? What are the service delivery? And going back to the community health perspective and investing in community health platforms to synergize the nurses and the midwife efforts, and overall, it's inclusivity in healthcare service marketplace for our full potential and optimal contributions, having our nurses and the midwives take the lead, being provided with the opportunities, and also uh, for them to be able to work and ensure that they provide the leadership that they deserve. I just want to really thank you for um, these contributions as we continue to discuss how we can be able to contribute and make this a success. Thank you. Back to you, Prof. Doreen. Thank you, Edna, and we do appreciate that perspective. The next is the South African perspective, and uh, Prof. Poshe Jordan will be enlightening us on that. Poshe Jordan is the executive head of the Department of Nursing and Midwifery, Stellenbosch University, South Africa, where undergraduate and nursing qualifications are offered. She holds a PhD in nursing, master's in business management, and a specialist in critical care nursing and nephrology in nursing. Her research focus is critical care nursing, evidence-based practice, and patient safety in nursing. Poshe is in the executive board um, member of the Forum of University Deans in South Africa. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Prof. Kaura, and good morning to all of you. And I also acknowledge uh, our minister, our DVC, our vice dean, and Professor Glenn Vagrai, all protocol observed. Um, in view of the WHO's declaration of being the International Year of the Nurse, we all started to celebrate nursing around the globe earlier this year, but that um, has shifted very quickly from being in the celebration of nursing to the COVID-19 pandemic. And you will agree with me that across the globe, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused implicitly and explicitly um, untold circumstances, suffering, devastation, um, circumstances that uh, is related to financial and economic turmoil, mental health um, um, uh, manifestations and so forth. And apart from that, nursing has been affected because as you all heard that nurses are the frontline workers and are the backbone of the healthcare profession. And the ICN has also released a report that say that 230,000 healthcare workers contracted COVID-19 and of that, more than 600 nurses succumbed to this virus. In South Africa, however, we have more than 400,000 registers on the South African Nursing Council database and approximately 27,360 healthcare workers has been tested positive for COVID-19 in South Africa and approximately 230 succumbed of the virus, of which 52% were nurses, with a mortality of 0.9%. However, it was encouraging that the recovery rate was 58%. And apart from this statistic mention, nurses and nursing in the profession has been um, experiencing some challenges with related to COVID-19, and I think that is no different in the rest of the globe. 
And some of those challenges include role conflict. Role conflict in the sense of personal conflict, professional conflict, how do you deal with the situation of the pandemic, how do you deal with your family life, where does isolation comes in and self-isolation. And I think that has impacted a great um, uh, role in terms of, of the nurses and the nursing profession. Secondly, it was fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety of contracting the virus, of transmitting the virus to significant others and family members, but also anxiety. Anxiety about how do you deal with this novel virus? How do you manage it? We've seen over the past few months that this is evolving. The management strategies has, has increased, has changed daily, and nurses were faced with those challenges of how to deal with the, the strategies. For instance, mechanical ventilation for acute respiratory distress syndrome changed drastically from mechanical ventilation invasively to high flow nasal oxygen therapy and nurses had to deal with that and with that came the responsibility to transform their own education and to also professionally develop them to be on par with these daily changes that were expected of them within the nursing profession. Then also guilt, guilt of being there for their family members, but at the same time guilt of taking the lead within the profession, guilt of not being able to give of themselves, guilt of not being able to do enough in terms of the nursing profession and what nursing stands for. And that all led to moral distress, and the moral distress was linked to staffing. We all know there's been a shortage of staffers with um, the, the field hospitals being erected, with staffing of equipment, um, uh, your resources of equipment, PPEs for instance was a huge conversation for a couple of months and how did nurses deal with that because that forms the core of what they need to do and how did they navigate the space within the COVID-19 um, pandemic and that also lead to burnout burnout in terms of emotional burnout, physical burnout, and the feelings of feeling isolated and helpless contributed greatly to this burnout as well. But then also it was about palliative care because this was a newly diagnosed virus and how do you palliatively care for something that is so different and that is changing on a, diff on a daily basis and in what, what decision making and what direction do you give as a leader within the nursing profession. And then it was death and dying and although all of us has learned about death and dying within our different spaces, this has become death and dying of a different nature. And as one nurse said, death and dying was core of my being in terms of my education. However, this is so different in dealing with the COVID-19 patient. And I think those are the lessons that we need to take forward and we need to transform our education and think about these things that nurses went through and how to navigate that within our spaces going forward. It was also stigmatization, stigmatization in the face of if I'm COVID positive, how will my neighbors, how will my friends, how will my significant others experience me? Because there has been quite a bit of stigmatization around the COVID-19 pandemic and those positive um, patients. Then also, in, but during this period of the pandemic, we also seen that nurses arise to the challenge. Nurses move from all these challenges, these physical challenges, emotional challenges, anxiety, to taking individual action uh, in standing up and knowing how to navigate the space. But then it moved more to a community action, and a community action that speak of Ubuntu, I am because we are. And as it stood together, and certainly in South Africa, we've seen in various platforms, whether it was acute care, whether it was primary care, whether it was long-term care facilities, our nurses actually stood together in the profession for the sake of the patients and it was the first time that really it was so explicitly noticeable that nurses took the noble tradition of the profession to another level, that they care for patients from a sense of recovery to a peaceful death that is um, reported in our nurses' oath. And that was remarkable just to see that amidst of all these challenges, nurses produced and came up with a, a level of resilience, a level of grit that was highly commendable. And with that, some of the lessons was the mental horsepower. 
they're really pursued within this, standing the test and apart from the political space, the unions and everything else that has been happening, our nurses stood on the front line and have been the soldiers in this war, for lack of a better description, and taking on the challenge to care for those that has been entrusted to their care. They continue to deliver care with compassion, with um, dedication, and amidst their fears for the COVID-19 pandemic, they rose about the challenge. And in the time when social distancing is actually what was required, nurses were the one that provided that human connectedness at the bedside while caring for these patients, and that is to be commended for. The lessons of Florence Nightingale nursing practice during the Crimean War are still being applied today, hand washing, social distancing, and I think that made even the year of the nurse much more profound in practicing those lessons that Florence Nightingale installed about 200 years ago. And in 1870, Florence Nightingale stated, that it will take about 150 years for the world to see the kind of nursing that was envisaged. And perhaps with the conversions of these two events, it is time to highlight the role of the nurse um, in the nursing profession that is so critically and so needed within this country and globally. And I believe that as we navigate even further our way through the COVID-19 pandemic, the WHO mandate to declare 2020 as the International Year of the Nurse has become so much more profound. Other lessons that we learned was that there was definitely a need for education, for professional development, for transformative care. My colleague previously mentioned some of the nuggets that is in the State of Nursing World Report, and I think it's so important that we take up that challenge and pursue education in a different level. There's a need to develop a health and well-being framework. There's a need for situational counselling and debriefing. There's also a need to increase confidence and risk associated with moral state. And there's a need to develop moral resilience and to build our neural pathways for self-awareness and self-regulation. And it is definitely investment in taking nursing education and the nursing profession forward to address the global needs, to meet the country's demand, to respond to changing technology. And this investment is in addition to the creation of new nursing jobs and strengthening the nurse leadership as a mandate, which was stated in the State of, of um, Nursing World Report. And indeed, nursing nurses across the globe should indeed be honored. They should be appreciated and gratitude should be shown where they work. Their compassion, their grit, their courage, their noble qualities, a deep sense of commitment to render care to those that are entrusted to them and to rise above their own circumstances, their own vulnerabilities, their own fears, their own anxieties and uncertainties should be acknowledged and deliberated and celebrated throughout and beyond the proclamation of the WHO. Now I want to salute every nurse, every nurse category that has been working through this COVID-19 pandemic and has given of yourself so unselfishly. And to salute the nurse leaders and everybody that contributed this far. And I believe that we will continue to just give of the best and the best that we have in contributing to this pandemic. So I thank you so much. I would also hereby yeah, want to take the opportunity to introduce our next speaker, which is Professor Hester Klopper. Professor Hester Klopper is the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Strategy and Internationalization at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, where she is responsible for overall institutional strategy, the institutional research and planning, business intelligence and information governance, corporate communication marketing and student recruitment, and the international strategy and relations. In addition, she's a professional in the Department of Global Health, the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. And in her capacity, she has supervised over 50 masters and over 35 PhD students, published more than 80 peer-reviewed uh, articles, 
and is the editor editor in chief of the Elsevier journal IJAMS. Internationalization and global health has become a focus area of her work over the past decade, and through a visionary leadership, the Global Advisory Panel on the Future of Nursing and Midwifery, which is known as GAPFON, was established. She has served as the chairperson of GAPFON for 2017 to 2019. She also serves as the director on the boards, on several boards, for instance, the Consortium for Universities in Global Health, which is currently running from 2018 to 2022, 2021, amongst other things. In country, she's a fellow of the Academy of Science, a member of the South African Academy for Science and Art, a member of the Institute of Directors for South, of South Africa, and a fellow of Academy of Nursing of South Africa, which is known as FASA. Professor Esther Copper, I'll let you. Yeah. Uh, thank you and good morning everyone and, and thanks for that, that kind but quite lengthy introduction, appreciate. Uh, program Director, uh, Professor Norma French Mbombu, Professor Linda Gray, Gray uh, Professor Julia Blitz uh, and uh, Professor uh, now I'm blank, Jordan <laughs> and then our colleagues from abroad, I am indeed, uh, it's an honour to be here. And I want to especially welcome all the health professionals and then specifically the nurses and midwives that are tuned into this webinar today. Um, I'm sure that you all feel very welcome already, but I've been particularly asked to also welcome uh, Dr. Norma French Mbombu and Professor Glenda Gray here and then to introduce them. So what I'm going to do is to, to introduce them right here at the start and then I'll give a short uh, overview and a snapshot of some of the international perspectives on the, on the celebration in terms of the International Year of the Nurse and then I will, I will pass on to you. So let me first start off with uh, Professor uh, uh, Norma French Mbombo. Uh, who has been the Western Cape Minister of Health uh, and that succeeded after she was the Minister uh, in the Department of Culture, Affairs and Sports. And we are very pleased that, that you shifted uh, to, the, uh, to the Department of Health Minister. Before entering the politics, she was Associate Professor in the School of Nursing at the Faculty of Community and Health Sciences in the Department at University of the Western Cape. Dr. Mbombu holds a PhD in Gender and, gender and Human Rights uh, and a master's in maternal and child health um, following her bachelor's in nursing science. She previously worked in the, in the province and local governments which span the departments in Eastern Cape as well as in KwaZulu-Natal. Her expertise as a nurse and a midwife has greatly contributed to her passion and care for the health of communities. Um, under her leadership we have seen the thoughtful plan to mitigate the pandemic here in our province. She herself has tirelessly visited communities to share information and to see that, that plans were in place. And uh, we indeed thank you for, for your leadership in this regard, Minister Mbombo. Professor Genda Gray, uh, President and CEO here at the South African Medical Research Council, an NRF, a one rated scientist, and for our colleagues from abroad joining in in this webinar, which really means she is one of the world's leaders in her field of research, uh, has been a research professor of pediatrics at the University of the Witwatersrand, a director at the Perinatal HIV Research Unit in Soweto. Professor Gray has been involved, as long as I can remember, in vaccine research, and this really started in, in 2000 when we first met at Fitz University, uh, really leading the work in developing a vaccine for HIV, and, and since she has, has continued um, contributing in that area. I also want to acknowledge you for your leadership, the recognition that the Minister, National Minister of Health has given you as part of the Ministerial Advisory Committee and uh, really um, serving this country in terms of making sure that the best available evidence was there and to act on that. And at least I need to say we are very proud that you hold an honorary doctorate from Stellenbosch University. <laughs> so we could also recognize her in that way for, for the immense contribution you've made in the country. 
So let me start off and, and share just a couple of notes and my colleagues from both from East Africa, West Africa and, and South Africa so eloquently already said so much in terms of this International Year of the Nurse and Midwife. Uh, but uh, we have seen so much about uh, in the media over the, over the past couple of months the role that nurses have played. And I think uh, as the minister and Professor Glay will continue to speak uh, about the engaged citizenship uh, uh, framework, I do think this provides us with a vast opportunity to think about the challenges and opportunities that nurses can play now and continue to play globally. And we definitely look forward to some more fruitful engagement and broaden and, and how that will broaden our perspectives. Um, in talking about the WHO International Year of the Nurse and Mid Midwife, WHO Director Dr. Tedros Gabrishes has said, and I want to quote him, nurses are the backbone of any health system. Today, Many nurses find themselves on the front line in the battle against COVID-19. He refers to, in his quote then, to what we've already heard, the State of the World's Nursing Report 2020. And this is really a stark reminder of the unique role they play and a wake-up call to ensure that they get the support and they need to keep the world healthy. And I want to, to catch up on, on some of, of these themes that he has referred to. So therein really lies the key messages that we want to convey, especially in the year where the world has experienced the largest pandemic in recent history. Nurses and midwives play an integral role in health systems in all countries. And much more can and should be done, not only to get the support from governments or corporations, but I want to phrase it to say from clapping to investment. We are celebrating, yes, we are saluting nurses, but it's now time to shift towards indeed investment. And the real investment is needed across all of the communities across the world and into health services that nurses are equipped to do uh, and, 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 con and we should continue to do post and as we live with the pandemic in moving forward. There has been a realization that in many communities, nurses are people's first and often only access to health services. And we are very honored as nurses to often be there right when birth starts till the end of life. And from the care of mothers and babies, and also the needs of our elderly, which we have so much seen amplified in this time uh, of the pandemic. So at every stage of people's life, their health care is facilitated by nurses and midwives. One must therefore commend the WHO for prioritizing the work and needs of nurses and midwives. And I'm sure the greater visibility of our work benefits healthcare services around the globe and should strengthen systems as we move forward. However, estimates show that the world needs 9 million more nurses um, if it wants to achieve universal access to healthcare by 2030. And this is in 10 years time, less than 10 years from now. So a rather short period of looking of how we will close this gap in terms of nurses uh, that we will need. And this makes it more important why I think the WIH designated 2020 as the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife. I want to give some statistics and findings from the WHO report, uh, and as I've already said, the State of the World's Nursing Report 2020. It, does provide an in-depth look in the world of nursing as it is today and indeed shows that we need to invest and focus and address the shortcomings to make sure that we will achieve all the goals. The report reveals that investment is required in nursing education, in jobs, in leadership to reach those global healthcare goals. Furthermore, it shows we should 
And as we know that nurses are the largest component of healthcare workforce, and that nurses account for half of the of the workforce, in actual fact, 60% of the world's healthcare workforce is nurses and midwives. So indeed, the, indeed the largest group of healthcare professionals. In the report, we see that it, there's about 28 million nurses and midwives around the world. But although there has been an increase in this number between 2013 and 2017 of 4.7 million, there are still many more needed. And as says the report, and as we know here in Africa and on, on our continent, that Africa counts under the region where there's the largest need for, for more trained nurses. And it means certainly that we need to invest in nursing education. So this report really cements what we've seen and uh, from the Global Advisory Panel on the Future of Nursing, the GAPFON report that was released in 2016 by SIGMA, highlighting is specifically then that nurses should be involved in policy making, not on the, on the periphery and at the room, but being part of, of the policy making, the need for investment in nursing education and leadership development. The report uh, highlighted 93 actions that can be taken to shift nursing and midwifery to be future focused and to strengthen their, their roles in then health systems for the future. Here at Stellenbosch University, we have seen uh, a revitalization at our Department of Nursing and Midwifery. And since 2019, we're very pleased that our department has now also offering again the Bachelor of, of Nursing, um, which really forms part of a qualification mix that includes the master's and PhD programs. So tertiary education programs are there, but as the WHO says, it needs to urge governments and other stakeholders, and here I want to particularly include professional councils today, and I want to plead to councils to say, it is time to provide opportunities and accelerate nursing education and so that we can address the shortages. So it asks for a new way of looking at the uh, registration of qualifications so that we can escalate that process and that we make sure that we will be able to provide the optimal health care that we owe to all the communities across the world. So indeed, 2020 has been a challenging year and the world has suffered at the hands of COVID-19. But given the strain, strain that the healthcare system has suffered around the world, I really want to salute the nurses that has been at the front line of service delivery. The COVID-19 has put nurses, as we've heard, in a very dangerous and fragile position. Uh, this pandemic has impacted us all, and uh, especially as Professor Jordan has highlighted, the emotional effects that we have seen on, on nurses around the world. So, it has threatened our lives and most probably will continue to do so. And I often refer to not a, ne a new normal, but a next normal, which means that we would need to find ways of how we will live with pandemics in the future. And unfortunately, we've seen the loss of so many lives. We can only do what we want to do if we really take to heart the WHO campaign um, and what they wanted to achieve in terms of celebrating the International Year of the Nurse. We have to challenge these challenges every day. And I want to conclude by saying we have to invest in nurses and midwives as we move forward. I'm convinced that Minister Mbombo and Professor Gray will give us insight in how we can address some of these challenges that nurses and midwives face and opportunities that will lead us to finding solutions that ensure a healthy future for our communities across the globe. And the opportunity that as nurses and midwives, we are really part of engaged citizenship. I also want to extend my appreciation to the MRC specifically for taking hands with Stellenbosch University 
as part of this webinar series in celebrating the International Year of Thinners. So over to our esteemed guest. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 Minister, I think you first. Oh, okay. Unless um, Prokov suggests that I go first and the minister goes last. Uh, um, yeah. I had uh, more but to throw in Amina. Amina, 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 you go next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We're out of control. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, and uh, welcome to Honourable Minister and the President and CEO of the SAMRC. Um, to kick start, I'm going to uh, hand over to each of you uh, if you would like to say a few words based on the issues that have been raised by the region so far. So if we can start with Minister Mbombo, and then we will go to Professor Gray. Just a few initial comments, and then I have a few questions uh, from my side that I will pose to you. All right, thank you uh, for the opportunity. Uh, because I'm still going to speak again, but I just want to focus on the comments that have already been indicated. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, there is no other time that we have seen a need for nursing to rise up um, because there could be, there might be another pandemic, we don't know. But also using the lessons uh, from the COVID where we identified some of the gaps uh, for us who are actually the implementers uh, who are providing the health services. Uh, but one thing for sure, as, as the World Health Organization has identified uh, 2020 as the year of the nest, um, it's for, for us how can we be able just to grab this opportunity and make it work. For example, we have got the universal health coverage. Um, I normally add the social, say universal, uh, social and health uh, coverage. That is um, a, a, the approach uh, that is actually um, still has to be implemented, but it doesn't stop us to go forward because that's how even as South Africa and also even other countries will take us further. So you see now within the space of using the pandemic, and see how we can be able to make use of the nest to strengthen and invest, as Prof has indicated, because we now have to be on the investment uh, towards the universal health coverage. Again, globally, we have got the SDGs. Uh, if you look at all of the SDGs there uh, throughout, uh, whether it's an SDG related to the gender equality, which is actually for nursing, uh, it bridges that gap because it's a, it's a threefold um, when it comes to the nursing. It's the health part, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's the economy uh, and also it's the gender equality, but how do we ensure that in some of those SDGs um, we can make use of the system, uh, specifically with an essence, because it's not only the backbone, it's across all the mm -hmm. systems, it's the heartbeat, it's everything. <laughs> For the whole of the systems, it's a part of it in, in regard to that kind of a space. And uh, um, a, a prof has indicated, um, uh, making an example of the Florence Nightingale, uh, back to the basics, the hand washing. Now we find ourselves, now we're no longer talking more about the antibiotics. We're talking about the hand washing. Uh, we're talking about the most important thing that I could keep in the data, because that's what the Florence Nightingale was doing. Because we may have been able to manage this COVID if you don't you make use of the data and come up with the various approaches based on the data that we could have. Uh, but the most important thing is about the social determinants of health. Uh, because it goes beyond, again, on biomedical, what we see in our health facilities, but uh, how we can ensure uh, you stop, um, you keep, you stop mopping the floor, because actually when people come to the hospital, you are mopping the floor, where you could be able to prevent these uh, closing the tap in the communities. How can nurses work uh, with the, um, the mid-level, like the computer workers, in order to prevent that part of it, so that we could be able to make hospitals uh, a, a place where we can have some of these invasive interventions, the high rates of flow and all of those, that for the ordinary people could be managed elsewhere, because it also talks about the universal health coverage, that a state shouldn't be the only, uh, shouldn't hold monopoly in rendering the services. Others, uh, other players, whether it's a private, private, I'm talking about the civil society, the NGOs, and also the private in regard to the private health, and how can you able to do so? 
And just clinging on the international ICN, the international um, uh, um, uh, the ICN uh, for the nurse, where they identify leadership in nursing throughout. If you recall, in 2017, they were focusing on the, in terms of how, it, actually the theme is always that the nurse, a voice to lead, where they talk about achieving the SDGs, and then in 2018 about the um, health is a human right, in 2019 the health for all, and then now about nursing, a voice to lead, nursing the world to health. How can piggyback on some of these, because the work is already there, it becomes easier to uh, piggyback on these kind of thematic areas and then you can have that kind of a language um, for the whole world. But lastly, um, the, the, when the World Health Organization identify the building blocks of trust in the health system, as you know that we have more than more, one health system, uh, the, what you see, the services, it's about a combination of other blocks, other health system, which is the health information system, uh, the human resources, leadership and governance, and the health financing, availability of medicine, and all of those. We do know now we have got another block, the people. How do we ensure now we bring the people into this part of the system? Uh, taking note now, the face of the COVID specifically is no longer a, a, a public health, but also we talk about the poverty, the, the malnutrition, the inequalities, the hunger. You see, we're going to see many children and the older person, the vulnerable people who go um, uh, hungry. So how do we ensure uh, we go beyond um, that space where we strengthen uh, the people as part of a system to strengthen our system, but the people as nurses themselves? Because it's not long about that um, it's your job to do it, but the whole kind of caring for our staff uh, in regard to the, the physical part, the mental health part, and the educational part, because we need to provide them the tools. If you have seen where in the Western Cape, we have to fast track um, to come up with a short course on the critical care capacity management, where we have to train people quickly, quickly. Where we saw that in as much as that, we said we, have got, we are creating extra beds for critical care beds and for palliative care beds. But you realize, actually, we don't have the people. We have to train more nurses. You can have the, all the beds and have all the machines and plug everywhere. But you need the people, and those people were the lessons. So how we can go beyond and the lessons learned? There might be another pandemic. So why don't we actually train the nurses on how to tackle pandemics, uh, for example, as part of that? Thank you very much. You're on mute. You're on mute. You can on mute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Minister. So I'll go on to Prof. Glenda Gray and maybe just a very short uh, introduction reflecting on what you've heard uh, and what your suggestions are, and then we'll move on to some questions. Yeah. Prof. Director, mm -hmm. Minister, um, esteemed uh, Stellenbosch University <laughs> next to me, East and West Africa, and my colleagues in uh, at the MRC offices in Victoria. It's really great to be here, and I'm going to say a, a few words, and I'm going to talk about mostly in my personal experience mm -hmm. as a pediatrician with nurses. So I agree, it's time to celebrate and acknowledge the role of nurses and midwives um, and their contribution to um, health, both in, in South Africa, in Africa, and globally. Um, it is true that the nurse and midwife is the backbone, mm -hmm. is the backbone of the healthcare system, and it's not the doctor. Is the nurse. And so nurses and, and midwives have always been on the core face of healthcare. And as some of you have mentioned, they are the foot soldiers and they are brave and courageous. And they do have to navigate this rough terrain of healthcare on our continent. And it is rough terrain on the healthcare of our continent. You know, I'm going to underscore that. So as a young doctor and pediatrician, um, nurses and midwives always held our hands um, and supported us. In fact, they taught me how to deliver <laughs> my first baby mm -hmm. and how to do a physiotomy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the registrar or the consultant, it was the nurse that held my hand and helped me deliver my first baby and teach me how to do a physiotomy. Yeah. And I think that is the story of, of, of healthcare um, in South Africa. It was the nurses that are showing young doctors um, how to manage um, their care. Um, I learned very quickly to consult early and value the contribution of nurses. 
In fact, as a medical student, um, I was a nursing assistant. So to, to, to um, earn money um, as a medical student, I took on the job of being a nursing assistant. And so I learned to carry bed pans. I learned to take a pulse, temperature, and feed uh, patients. And then I learned what it was like to be a nursing assistant. And I can say that is probably one of my hardest jobs I ever had to do in my life, was to be a nursing assistant. So I also want to acknowledge the role that, um, that nursing assistants play um, in, in making sure that, that patients are clean, that they, they, um, they, they, can, they can go to the toilet and they can be fed. They can monitor their temperature and pulses, because that, that is the backbone of care. So I want to acknowledge um, the care that they do. But also I want to know and acknowledge the, the, the care and the support that nurses have given in epidemics that we face in Africa. The first was HIV, uh, then Ebola, um, and now COVID-19. And as a young doctor, um, I witnessed HIV exploding um, in my hospital. And the nurses and I would navigate, and sometimes the nurses would say to me, do we really have to tell this mom that her, her baby is positive? You know, can, we, can we do it with the next admission? You know, you know, do we have to destroy um, her life now? And these are the kind of compassions. So I, I, I witnessed the compassion of nurses. In Ebola, we saw, in terms of mortality, we saw how, um, how nurses uh, succumbed to Ebola because they were the frontline uh, workers. And that we've also heard now with COVID that 5% of all healthcare admissions, well, of, all, of all admissions to hospitals are uh, attributed to healthcare workers. And we've heard about the deaths of healthcare workers um, and, and the nurses who have, been, who have borne the burden of the healthcare. And we've seen the stigma of uh, healthcare workers and nurses um, with COVID-19, particularly when we were talking about going back to school. And there were some parents in classes that actually didn't want the, the children of healthcare workers, of nurses, to come back because uh, they were scared that these children wouldn't affect their children. And so the whole stigma, it wasn't just the nurse, but her children as well, and how um, instead of being celebrated at, at schools, we found that often these children um, were shamed and, um, and, and, were, and were not welcome to, to, to come back to school. And we have to deal with those issues of stigma and discrimination. As a researcher, um, I, as I progress from a pediatrician to become a clinical researcher, I soon learned the value of, of, of the nurses that worked in my team and how important they were. Um, how important they were in helping us serve the community, um, do stakeholder engagement to earn out the trust of, of research in, in communities. Um, how they helped us participate in engaging research and also how they were activists um, uh, while we were doing HIV research for human rights and the dignity of people. And um, research in this country, clinical research in this country, cannot happen without nurses. Very early on in the COVID-19 epidemic, we had an HIV vaccine trial to run, and it was our fourth vaccination. If we didn't get this vaccine vaccination in, we would have killed four years of research. And we appealed to our clinical staff to, during lockdown to help us do that fourth vaccination. And our nurses and our doctors rose to the occasion. We kept our research clinics open so we could get our full vaccination in and we could, we could deliver on our mandate for this regimen. And so hopefully we'll know next year whether this vaccine works or not. But thank God we could get that full vaccine in and I want to acknowledge the nurses for that. There have been the voice against inadequate PPE. So it's the nurses that have articulated that, they, that PPE is inadequate, it's inferior and that they're stocked out. So it wasn't for the nurses they, 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 we would not have known about the, the inadequate um, PPE. They also have also have noted and have have, ex, ex, um, have have spoken out about the unacceptable working conditions that often they have to do. I have to work work in, and that's an important thing. So these nurses are brave. You know, they say this is not right. Our working conditions aren't good, and um, it's not good to put us in the front line without adequate protection. And they were very important to articulate that need. Um, I want to also, um, you, but all of you have spoken about the, the quality of care that was delivered by nurses in, in the COVID epidemic and how quickly they had to navigate all the new processes, how they had to manage ICU, how they had to help um, patients who were dying interface um, with their families, how often they would use their cell phone and their data 
to do the course to people who were outside outside the hospital and didn't know what had to happen. And so I want to acknowledge the um, the the fact that nurses understood how terrible it is to die during COVID because you died out your loved ones. And in fact, they were the ones that were delivering the care and delivering the uh, the, the palliation. And we want to acknowledge that. And so I do want to acknowledge just finally, Amina, is that. Um, the leadership of nurses during all pandemics, um, during HIV, during Ebola, and now during COVID-19. And to say that, um, that without, without nurses, uh, we would not have any healthcare system. So thank you very much. And again, you know, it is a special and important year to acknowledge nurses. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so many issues have been brought to the fore on various levels, the personal level, the health systems level, leadership governance and finance and education. And I'm now going to open up to the regions to ask questions. Uh, some will be specifically directed to those, uh, others might be slightly different, but let's start a discussion so that we can try and find solutions uh, within all of these issues. So I'd suggest that we start with uh, West Africa um, if you could unmute and put forward your question. I'm just doing them in the order of the presentation. So, thank you very much. Uh, I can only do an audio now because where I am, the network is not very stable. I don't want to go off. So, um, my question would... Go Hi. to Prof. Klopper. From the um, okay. fact that, can you hear me? Yes, you broke up a little bit, but we can hear you now. Yes, go on. Right. So, as I said, my network is not very good, so that's why I go off the uh, video. So, I was saying that my question goes to Prof. Klopper with her experience in the international front. How do we, as African nurses, um, collaborate with our partners to move beyond research or innovations, interventions that are solely human related, but then we go into areas that has an effect on the work that we do. For example, we are talking about hand washing, but what detergents are we using? What effect does it have on our hands, the long-term effect on the nurse? We are talking about using hand sanitizer. What is the quality thereof? And all the other things that we are using for uh, enhancing care in general. How do we position nurses and midwives to have a say or have contribution when it comes to these things? Thank you. So should I go on enough? Okay, good, good. Uh, thank you, Professor Asiato. I think what you're saying uh, at is in, in the essence of your question is really about collaboration. So what we've seen is, um, I think, at, at two fronts, especially with, with um, colleagues across our continent, is that often we find that our governments and institutions across the continent don't or let me say, are not very keen on using research results that comes from abroad. And there's often a call for no, that might not work in our context. So I think what we really need to, to see is how do we collaborate with large teams of research across the globe and bring the Africa voice and the Africa experience to the table as part of these large studies. I think that that's important. Uh, you already, you referred to, for example, um, you know, what's the effect of hand washing, the effect of, of the sanitizers we use. There's evidence for that. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to understand what are the impact of that uh, in terms of, of, our, different uh, of our different context across the, the continent. Um, so in terms of collaboration first, I don't see that nurses across our continent share the innovation of work that they are doing. And let me, let me um, say that as the editor of the International Journal for African Nursing Sciences, recently we've seen a call 
uh, asking could I identify over the last couple of months papers that speaks to the innovation of work that nurses across the continent has done. And to be honest, I could not find a paper that speaks specifically to innovations of nursing practice and midwifery practice in dealing with pandemic specifically and then, and, and, then and, and this is broadly. And by that I'm not uh, saying that it does not happen. I know it's happening, but we are not sharing what we're doing. We are not publishing. We are not telling the world that contribution that nurses are making. Um, so definitely in terms of collaboration, large teams, I need to think we need to be very clear on what we publish, sharing these innovations. And then the third point I want to make is that often nurses are forgotten in terms of policy. Uh, there's, there's the politicians and, and other officials that sit around the table and nurses are not at the table. And I think we need to find ways of how we can find inroads and being part at, of, of those discussions right at the, at the policy making because I think that will really escalate the work that, that nurses have been doing. Thank you, Prof. Thanks so much. I think we'll take a quick question from the next region, um, East Africa. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. I just want to quickly highlight uh, three questions. And um, the first I will direct to Prof. Uh, DVC, Esther. And within the region, what are the lessons can the region learn from the pandemic or human resources for health? how we can access and utilize the essential services, and as a region, how can we also tackle the issues of immigration and retention of healthcare workforce, especially during this time where we are seeing the shortages within our sector. The second one is uh, Prof. Gray. Um, in regards of the collabor collaborative opportunities that the region can explore for future preparedness, of the healthcare system in managing these epidemics. What are the opportunities and how can we have that collaboration to see those opportunities? And of course, finally, to the great pledge, um, our minister, I just also want also to ask within our region, what could be the best strategies for the expanded scope of practice for nurses and midwives and utilization of these nurses and midwives to the full potential for us to be able to maximize their contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Over to Minister. Okay, um, I think for me to answer the last one, maybe um, I really indicate that actually the pandemic has created more opportunities and also uh, more of um, how we can do things. Just to give an example. For the communication, I don't think a nursing, even during my time that I was there fully, that we, we took um, quite seriously the issue of the communication. For example, now with where people are unable, are, un, are unable to meet, because there used to be um, that practice of meeting in the training room, uh, when our Friday meeting and all of those. Like here, where I am in the province, where we have got about 50 plus hospitals and tourists and something of the primary health care facilities, and therefore as a district that we have to communicate. So the mere fact that we, we ended up going, not only in terms of the Zoom and all of those, but in terms of the way we communicate, and also how to dismantle the hierarchy. I think as part of the scope of practice, I think the communication as, a, as one of the courses, whether they're short or but they should part of that, especially in the context where you might have other epidemics, like you know, or pandemics, where communication is crucial. And then the issue of, uh, of entrepreneurship. <laughs> uh, uh, Prof indicated that it was the nurses and mostly actually identify these the substandard or suboptimal PPEs and also raising these issues. It doesn't stop for nurses because they are the ones who are mostly wearing these. So they can understand that this one, this that is being tied like this, uh -uh. because we have seen in some of in our hospitals, people will change it another way around, whereas uh, when it came from the supplier, it was another way around. So it doesn't stop for nurses, actually, but it's part of the whole of the health system anyway. 
um, to be actually to go to business. There's nothing wrong. Remember, you guys have coverage. We're talking about for everyone. To go to business and be suppliers themselves, or even to be consultants for them themselves, for the PPE, because they've been there, they learn this. That applies with the, even in the industry in terms of the sanitizers or soap and all of those. Why should be the, the people who are even non health uh, where we allow, I shall not allow per se, but that's what uh, the example of, um, of, of, of using that space. Also, the entrepreneurship, we saw the role of, of course, we do have private nurses um, who are assisted, they earn private, but also we find that they get assisted with some, with some various pharmaceutical companies in order to make up the infrastructure. So they get um, subsidized and then they charge own fees, uh, um, which we have seen in the Western Cape is mostly funded by the CIPLA. The role they play was in some of the clinics, you'll find that they are closed, but you find that they came, they bridged that gap so that people would rather pay 40 rand instead of uh, spending the long queue outside those just to keep that one meter distance. Let me go and pay 40 rand for my primary health care um, uh, or whatever, or even to get my treatment where we even use some of them uh, to, to leave the chronic medication there. I'm just making some of these uh, kind of the scope of practice. And then lastly, the environmental health aspect. Um, whilst uh, we indicated that uh, from the beginning, the issue of the basics uh, related to the social determinants of health, uh, the hand cleaning, um, the, all of those used to be part of the nursing. But we ended up forgetting about those. How do we ensure we include this part of the environmental health, the social determinants of health, because in as much as uh, we could be able to manage a uh, diarrheal infections. But when in an area there's a high level of overcrowding, uh, high densities, it might be a development of a housing issue. But at the end, we are the ones who have to, as have to absorb all of those. So how do we, within our scope of practice, that we could be able to have uh, even um, options for the people to go, something that are not pure health, but they all form the whole part of the hospital system. And in South Africa, there is that opportunity now. The scope of practice has been out. Um, people were had to comment, and they also they made it, although it might be more or less similar uh, to the previous, but at least they make sure that it's not all about the whole fruit salad. At least there is a focus there so that people can be able to encompass the whole of this. But in addition to that, um, they, we don't want to lose the vocational part of it. But we need to understand that we move with the times, especially going towards a uh, universal health coverage. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Prof. Gray. Any responses um, from you? So in terms of the, uh, the collaboration, um, what are that collaborative opportunities? So the um, collaboration uh, on our continent is critical. I think global collaboration is important because what we've heard, what we've learned from this COVID-19 epidemic is that this um, pandemic's no no borders. And so um, it's very important for us to learn how to collaborate and um, make sure that we are prepared for the next um, uh, uh, pandemic. And we need to work with the AU, we need to work with SADC, and we need, we need to work with the CDC Africa. And there, there are a couple of things that we have to ensure um, that, um, in, in for, the, for the future is that the, we need to share data. Um, it's important. Data is critical, and we have seen with COVID-19, mm -hmm. is that all the scientists, everybody made their data mm -hmm. freely available mm -hmm. so that we could learn. So that, that the sharing of data is critical, and the sharing of resources. And you know, um, and I, I know in South Africa, um, there was talk of moving equipment around. Mm -hmm. So you know, as, as the Western Cape uh, uh, recovered, you know, could the equipment go to the Eastern Cape? And we also saw the sharing of other things like oxygen. Uh, the long hauls of, of oxygen from Joburg to Putiski Hospital. Um, so that's important, the sharing of resources and how do we do that at, at, a, at a, a global level. Um, but what we also need in, in, in Africa is to improve our surveillance and our laboratory infrastructure. So if there's one thing that we, that we, we could have done better as a continent, or at a global level, so maybe I'm not going to just say South Africa or Africa, is that in, in, even in the US, there was a, a global, there was an underpenetration of testing. Uh, people were running around, there was no reagents, the CDC gave out the wrong 
um, thing, and there was never enough equipment and never enough reagents and, and ability to test. So at a global level, we must make sure that we have strong laboratory infrastructure and we have an ability to scale up testing and diagnostics, because what you need for a pandemic is you need diagnostics and you need a laboratory infrastructure, and that must go beyond just South Africa. You know, we need to work with the CDC Africa to do that, and we need to make sure that, that um, at, a, at a continent level, our laboratory infrastructure is important, and that's critical for the next epidemic. And then what's, what's even more critical for the next epidemic, is, as the minister has spoken about, is the resilience of our health system. So universal health coverage means that if there is an epidemic, um, the show must go on. You know, the epidemic must happen, but we must not stop diagnosing TB or HIV. We must stop, not stop immunizing our children. The show must go on. And so in terms of that, we need to know, you know, if we talk about universal health coverage, that means that um, the, the ship continues to go, we manage the epidemic, and we, we make sure that our health system isn't, isn't fragile. And we have to learn how to be resilient. And the only way we can learn how to be resilient is to work together and understand how we make health systems resilient. And so I think that that's all important in terms of lessons learned going forward is that um, uh, we need to have um, strong resilient health systems and a laboratory infrastructure uh, that supports diagnostics and testing and also the sharing of data will always be critical. Thanks. I think you had a question. I think yeah, the, you were the first one. On the should I continue, Amina? Yes, yes, continue. Uh, yeah, so, the, the, so some of the issues that I would have linked to, uh, for example, the question that you raised, Edna, would have, would have resonated with already what you've heard from the minister as well as from Prof. Gray. Uh, but most probably let me highlight um, some different issues in terms of human resources and immigration. Uh, immigration and mobility is, is a worldwide uh, phenomenon now. It's not very unique to only um, Africa. I, I think we, we see that around the globe. Um, what I would, however, think is critical for us to, to, to speak or to, to look at human resources for health as a whole and then immigration is that I do think it's time to look at the articulation of some of our, of all the healthcare professionals. Um, for example, we know in parts of our continent that the healthcare, prof uh, the, the healthcare workers are, are not regulated. There's not a standard in terms of the training, although they are critical as part of the healthcare system and the, and the work that they provide in the community. We can't do without them. Uh, we can't do with, for example, some of, of our nursing, well, the nursing assistant, but then similarly, we, we've also seen in other parts of of our system, things like the, the dentist assistant. That's the, what I want to call the, the support categories are becoming more and more important in ensuring uh, sustainability within human resources wealth. And I do think we need to unpack exactly how do we articulate these um, in, within our system. Uh, Edna, you are the registrar of, the, of the, the Kenyan Nursing Council and you know the imminent role that, that nursing councils, other healthcare professional councils, as well as regulators play in making it possible that we can train nurses and, and that, but I've not seen across our continent an enabling environment. It's, it's one of a stick and yard, it is very controlled, and I don't think that's what the system asks for. It asks for being nimble, nimble agile, uh, very uh, proactive uh, engagement. And the, I think that would really be a win-win if we can work with, with our professional councils and regulators to find ways, uh, not sacrificing the standards that regulators are striving towards, but to make sure that it's more nimble and, and that we can get through a, a process where we train quicker uh, and, and that there's um, some accommodation of getting them onto to, to the necessary registrars uh, as soon as we can. The other, and my last point related to this most probably, is um, linking both to the human resources wealth and, and immigration. I do think that it asks for a process, most probably similar to what is referred to as the Bologna process, mm -hmm. that 
uh, it's time for us across the continent to sit down and to think of, of a qualification that will speak to the, as a basis across the continent. I mean, if Europe has been successful in, in terms of this um, and, and getting a baseline for qualification, I think it's time for us. And that will actually provide us with the opportunity of mobility across the continent in a much more succinct way. Uh, people working in different parts of the continent, moving back to their own countries. And I think instead of trying to, to stop it, we should find ways of how we can really engage and use the richness of what healthcare professionals can bring across the continent. Thank you very much for that, for those responses. Um, I'll move on to uh, the South African region um, for any questions, and then we will pose a few more questions. Uh, so over to you in Cape Town. Thank you so much, Amina. Um, Professor Gray, I would just like to know, there is so much opportunity for research. We've got a, really a bulk of evidence that's been produced by our National Department of Health and at provincial level. And it seems to be there's a know-how to do gap in translating that evidence. So what are your views and maybe suggestions on how we can translate science and evidence to really um, further care and to, to help with that scientific evidence relation in implementing it at the ground level? Uh, so you, you're correct, is that um, we're very good at, at identifying research and we're actually even good at making policies and guidelines. Um, but we're very poor at, at, at knowing how to translate policy and guidelines into practice. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a gap. Um, I think South Africa is, is wonderful at making policies, but we, we, we are short on, the, on the how to implement it. And so, as you know, we collaborate. Uh, the Cochrane Centre collaborates with the University of Stellenbosch, and we've had this, this program called SAGE, where we, we, we try to understand what does gapness um, in being able to implement some of the, the practices that we've learned and um, have tried to develop a, a strategy to, to understand scale-up of policy or scale-up of, of practice and, um, and also how to, how to implement implementation science, and which is a new, a new, a new, a new um, science, implementation science. So you, you learn, uh, you know, this, this does that, and then you make guidelines, but no one follows it. And so because of this huge translation gap, we actually created a, a new indicator for the Medical Research Council, which is actually research translation, uh, because we felt that um, we were so poor as a country in translating research to action. And so this new, this new um, indicator will hopefully put some more meat on that kind of the last, it's kind of the last mile um, in a process to, to try and, and uncover some of the challenges into, into to, to scaling up evidence that, that it can help people. And, and this got everything from resuscitation um, we've seen. So when um, when people went out to train uh, nurses and doctors around um, neonatal resuscitation, it's, it's even things like um, orientating uh, the, the, the storeroom where the CPAP masks are. Um, and the key, you know, the key should not be there. You know, so it's, so it's about um, rapid process improvement and, and sometimes a, um, um, a real live lived experience of, of executing things. And we do this a lot in, in clinical research where we, we have time motion uh, studies where, where we, we, we see where the bottlenecks, so we, we love this, where the bottlenecks are in, in delivery and we try and re reduce redundancies. And so a lot of the time, um, these practical applications um, we think are obvious, but they're not. And, and, and the practical application of, of science, um, of, the, of the evidence uh, resulting from science, does require, how, okay, how do we bring in these things into our practice? And we did the same thing with um, HR. You know, when we introduced um, Neveropin to in, in antenatal care and HIV testing, and we had to like figure, okay, so how do you really put this in the flow in an in antenatal care? You know, who, who prescribes in the very pin? Where is in the very pin kept? And so to make, to make evidence um, uh, successful and to make evidence implementable, you sometimes have to do what the, the, the most, the, put that into a practical 
exercise to try and learn how you take things to scale. And, and sometimes we do this, and I guess we did this just at, at subconsciously during COVID, how you went quickly and you know, how, how flow nasal oxygen, you know, we learned very quickly what to do. And now we need to make sure that um, you know, we continue to learn from those um, experiences. And so I'm looking forward to seeing how we do in research translation in the future and, and having this as an indicator and things that um, we want to put, um, we, we want to make our evidence um, implementable and, and, and usable. And, and, and that is the ultimate of doing science, otherwise why bother? And so hopefully we'll be good at this. You can, in five years time, come talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much. Can I just add uh, some other evidence? Because yeah, sure. uh, I think there's a lot that actually from the MRC side they are doing because it's, it's not all about the research that ends up landing on the on the journals, but also how we as the health service providers to make use of those. Let's make an example. Even the the, the positions um in regard to um to during the COVID, the way you lie on your on the prone and all of those it's part of this so it's not only the high uh, uh, flow and uh, nasal flow plus also the excess deaths which is now we end up being an obsession in terms of that why we report the report on the death that happened in our facilities but if with the mrc excess deaths as part of the part of burden of disease studies where now we find that we always follow, if they are saying that we have got 1,000 deaths that have happened outside, we could able to track. That's why for us in the Western Cape, we ended up um, a part of the differential strategy for testing. We also had to test the uh, posthumously uh, for those who happen outside. Even with the alcohol, it comes from the MRC study in terms of the alcohol during the COVID. Same applies with the triage uh, in our triage centers. So that's why it's crucial that as a government, we, we should create that enabling environment, that the information we get from the scientists, how we can be able to implement and apply, and also even in towards the uh, uh, collecting that data or producing that knowledge. We should be able to create that environment where if you have got some uh, good proposal that you want to implement in regard to a certain area, we should be able to welcome part of it as long well, that is ethical and that it doesn't jeopardize the patient and also doesn't use stage resources. Because at the end, as we know that with health, you need, it must be evidence-based practice, no matter what. So it's no longer about the intuition that I have a feeling that it should be. It's no longer like that, so, yeah. Uh, thanks so much. So it's like building the system while we're working in it, so and while we're researching it. Yeah. I'm going to move on to a different stream of questions now, uh, and it really is to ask you, Minister Mbombo and Prof Gray, to reflect on your personal experiences. Much has been said about personal difficulties and how to build resilience amongst healthcare providers. We heard about healthcare providers feeling guilty, having role conflicts, uh, death and dying, stigmatization. So I'll start with the first question to Minister Mbombo. Just based on your own journey from maid to midwife to minister, if you reflect on your own journey, what can you take from that journey that you can put forward to offer a support or offer advice uh, to the world as we try and support nurses and midwives so that they flourish. So is there anything that stands out for you in your personal journey? Oh, yes. Um, I think the, the, the besides that, at the time that we were growing up, of course, for us, we are older people, we were growing up during the upper clicks where the system uh, was difficult to navigate. So you had the limitation. So for me, uh, the only way that I thought at the time that would take me away from the poverty is about access to education. So in as much as that I ended up having the, the metric, which is done at 10, but in the way now um, the barriers when it comes to access to higher education because there was no money. So at the time, teaching and nursing were the easiest vehicle uh, in addition to, um, to the part of where uh, the, the, the accolades and the, and, and, and the status that were uh, put around that. Because at the time, nurses' house, teachers' house, would find that they're eating bread and butter, whilst for us, we're eating just dry bread. 
So you end up that you are, whilst you want to be a nurse because you want to eat bread and butter, and also you want the status, but at the same time the passion. What I could say now is that um, it's no longer about women only, because we, there are so many males that are there, but because I'm also a, a, a gender activist, uh, I've seen how actually the girl child, it has promoted also the, uh, the way for the girl child to be able to be there. But the last thing that I want to do is about people, uh, the basic education, that's the start of it, the quality education, because it's not all about the passion, then you can just use your own hands or your, your grandmother's skills in order to be a nurse. The issue of the evidence, nursing is a science. So people, uh, it's okay to choose subjects from the beginning in metric that could be able to take you there so that you don't end up not knowing where the choices are. So that's where we, we should be able, as I indicated earlier, that uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it, 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 it's kind of where nursing, it provides that opportunity related to the gender equality because majority are women. It also for the, for the economy, because it boosts us, we, are, we ended up being middle class taxpayers as well, but also uh, to, to, to close that uh, poverty cycle uh, intergenerational. So we provide that opportunity and also in regard to the space for health. So that's where things are. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much for that. And moving on to Prof. Gray, uh, you reflected earlier on your experiences as a female doctor, uh, as a young doctor, and I wonder if you could add to that and speak about your journey in navigating the rough terrain uh, previously and then also your current journey, you know, being part of the Ministerial Advisory Committee and reflect on the role of nurses and how we can build resilience as we walk together on this path where we're trying to not only treat uh, patients with COVID-19, but also find a solution to prevent it. That's a tough question. I think that the most important thing I've learned along this journey, on my life journey, is, is the, the importance of, of, of support and, um, and, and working as a team. Um, if you, you, know, you, can't do, you can't do this journey alone and you can't do work that we do alone and, and we, we have to see ourselves as as, as part of a team um, and willing to, to work together and toward a, a common goal. Um, and, and sometimes often as the, the leader of the of the team in my in my in my position I've always felt the importance of um, creating opportunities for for people. And so um, uh, I, I always remember what, what, what Bon Gani Mayosi always taught me was to lift as you rise, mm -hmm. and that um, you can only um, that, that you, you 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 as you rise, you, you need to create opportunities. You can't wait for one day and, and tell you the this or that to create opportunities for people. I also um, uh, realized that um, you know women women are are um, are are important. You know, so, so South Africa and MRC has, has two things to do. We have to address a racial transformation and gender transformation and uh, ensure that, that there's, there's parity in, in all those areas. And, um, and I guess that, and that, and that is, uh, um, as, a, as a leader of the team, to always make sure that we're addressing the issues of, uh, of, of poverty, of class, of race, and of, 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 of gender disparity. And that's very important. In, in, in creating a team, so and I think so. Just finally, um, um, these, terra these terrains are rough, and uh, you have to have lots of courage. And and what I have learned is that women have courage, and um, and and that's very important, you know. And we've heard today, uh, you know, just, in, in, just how incredibly courageous our women have been um, in 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 the COVID epidemic, and how important it is to to work in a team. No, thanks so much. And the next question to Minister Mbombo. Can you discuss a little bit more about your experience with volunteerism, community support, and the quest for social justice uh, while you were in nursing and midwifery, and how that enabled you to become uh, the Minister of Health in the West? Uh, yes, um, I used to call it scholarly activism at the time when I was an associate. So, was my former dean in the city next to me. 
as my former dean. Professor Klopp is my former dean of health sciences, where I was. Uh, um, Professor Dorit was my student. Oh. My master student. <laughs> so uh, Portia was also my colleague at the time. So uh, I'm sitting with a family from the people. So at the time, you could people would have niche areas, and also was also part of the a, a forum of the University of Medicine in South Africa. Things. So you, the niche area for me, it was about the scholarly activism, which not only it was limiting, or not only in South Africa. In South Africa, I was part of every movement, uh, but also in Africa. So I've been everywhere in Africa except in the northern parts, in the northern parts of Africa, but working with the civil society. Uh, I recall at the time that we even have a, um, a, a capacity building how the chairs of the um, of the chairs of the health portfolios in parliaments in the southern, uh, eastern, and also the western Africa, as part of a collaboration with the UCT at the time, where we build capacity on how they can use it as part of formulation of the policy, up to the level that I did some work with the South South, with the India, and also the Peru. But my area was more on sexual and reproductive health and rights. Uh, at the time that I was doing with Gifri, but also in regard to the, uh, the women activism, it ended up lending me to the UN uh, in the directorate of the women. So that's why uh, when I started in this portfolio, uh, was I very committed participation and involvement. So that's why the first thing I did was I come up with a legislation to recognize clinic committees. It was in as much as that they've been there previously, but there was in March of the recognition in the legislation, because in government, you cannot put money, resources, to anything that is not legislated. So I ended up being able to do that at the primary health care level. So I've developed around that part of space, which is at the time now with the NHI uh, that is being introduced, the bill, uh, all over the whole province, where with a group of the committee members to create awareness, what is it all about, so that they could be able uh, to have a voice when it comes to the public hearings. So that's why I've been, and then uh, previously then, I, uh, my slogan was nothing about us without us. But you now what I'm laughing at is the same people that I used to protest with are the ones that were saying to me that they remember us. It's quite interesting. Uh, thanks, thanks very much for sharing that. And then to Prof. Gray, um, there's a question around leadership. Um, and leadership is direly needed in all our settings uh, in South Africa and in other countries. Do you have any ideas about what can be done or how can we facilitate and create enabling environments so that nurses and midwives can emerge as leaders individually and together as a team of healthcare professionals now and moving forward? Um, I think that's very important. I think in the health sector, um, issues around leadership um, have been neglected. Um, we, we, have, we have these tiered structures where um, um, when you come into a ward, there's the nurses and the doctors come and do their ward rounds, they do their prescription and then they go to a clinic. And um, uh, the, the team is very fragmented um, very often. And I say, I think the first thing that we have to do is reorientate um, the way we, we manage teams in, in the health system, uh, how we manage clinics and how we manage wards, and that the, 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 the nurse doctor team are more integrated um, than, than, um, than what I experience. And, um, and that you develop a, a team uh, where our nurses feel supported by, by doctors and, and, um, and, and then the, the leadership and man management structure is obvious so that the patient um, gets the best care, and so I think um, in terms of the you know when you when we're reorientating the health system and we're trying to make the health system resilient, um, the, the people as you've all mentioned are incredibly important, the human resource, but also I think um, the way the human resource uh, team is orchestrated um, will make for a much better health system. So I do think we need to uh, we, we 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 are trained so poorly. You know we need to integrate doctor and nurse training um, in, a, in, a, in a way. So we talked about um, you know, having a, a, a nurse a nursing qualification that's 
that's um, uh, the same across the whole continent. But but how come we've never ever spoken spoken about or developed a, a curriculum or a, a or a structure that enhances um, the management of a team? That is, is not I mean it's not just doctors and nurses. They're talking about OT, special you know speech therapists and everything. That the, the team needs to be more um, coherent and, and more functional. So I guess if I was um, um, the head of a university. <laughs> Maybe one of the first things I would do is, is say, hey, how do we, how do we um, optimize the way we teach healthcare workers? So not not the, not differentiate doctors from nurses or OTs or porters or or um, clerks in a hospital. But how do we how do we um, um, run a health system um, with healthcare workers? Um, that, that, that is efficient and um, and we can get good performance out of that team. So you know maybe it's a, it's a different way of thinking about things. But I, you know I don't think I was the head of a, a, a clinic or a uh, ward. That's what I would endeavour to do. Thanks very much. I don't know if it's not from the Health Worker Association. So I have a different view on the healthcare worker. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. It's all about the team, isn't it? We can't do, uh, one's not more important than the other. So that's a great perspective. I don't know if Minister Mbombo or Prof Klopper would like to add anything to that question, to the answer. Uh, if I could add, the interprofessional education is crucial. It has happened at the clinical area where, just making an example, uh, George Hospital, uh, which is, is also linked to the UCT, in terms of sending their medical students there, and then they've got a strong focus on pediatrics, because I'm usually those with a pediatrician. So the registrars uh, who are pediatrics, they form part of the group. Uh, the child health nurses, also from the UCT, they form part of the group. So it, it ends up creating their focus here around that aspect, the clinical area. But ideally, I think what is proposing that there could be some formality at that level at the university level, so that even those students, whether they are from the UWC, from Stellenbosch, and all of those, if they are placed in a certain area where there's a, stro there's a stronger, like in the, in the West Coast, Fred and Hospital, because we're talking about the cataracts, there's, there's a, a, a the, 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 the eye care, or the, 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 the eye clinic, including the surgery related to the eye, the person who initiated that is a nurse, uh, who was trained by Professor um, Karyos Yuna, just making an example. So without her there, there will never be in that hospital being known about the IK. But the question, how do we ensure whether it's an opt 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 ophthalmologist or the opticians or the other people, even at the programs at the university level, they can use that as a clinical area or as a learning site, which is interprofessional education. I think that's where we are. And when it comes to the nursing, it, we have to go back to how we ensure uh, for all those who have had the postgraduate clinical uh, um, qualifications, the like clinical masters and all of those, they also become part of the clinical uh, part of those. For example, I was teaching advanced midwifery postgraduate, I was teaching them. But there was no opportunity for us as nurses or midwives at the time who are academics teaching clinical subjects to be in the field, and yet for the ONGs, uh, they become even head of the clinical units. But how could the university recognize that clinical component, let's say, for the nurses? Because it's not. So why would I go and check uh, whether the river can be able to deliver bridge, and yet I'm expected to write papers? So one has to look in terms of this. Mm, thank you, thank you. Prof. Klopper, would you like to add anything? Yeah, so my thoughts about leadership is most probably, um, although we, we need to give recognition for formal training programs and, and the formal training uh, of leadership, uh, I think the challenge for us across the continent as we see the total shift in terms of the demographics and, and the youth explosion across the continent um, and also taking into consideration organizations like the International Labour Organization and uh, the, the World Bank in terms of the future of work. 
what type of leadership as healthcare professionals we would need to take uh, to, to the roles that we would need to play, I think is also important. So I want to make uh, just one or two references then in terms of so leadership for me is really taking up that role yourself and not just the formal and taking up that role and I want to link it to, to some points in terms of engaged citizenship. As the first one I want to say is that I think we've got a, a role, our leadership role is to stay up to date no matter what. <laughs> and often I find that a challenge uh, for, for clinicians across the continent because of the limited access to information and the challenges of, of work overload. So I think that is to, to really take up your leadership role, you need to be up to date. And, and somehow we need to find ways of doing that. The second point I want to make is that as a leader, you need to be a volunteer. And that volunteership could be either in the community, but also the volunteership for your profession. And often I see that um, that is a challenge for clinicians, taking up the volunteer the role. Um, for me personally, as a leader, I need to consistently check my space and point as, as being privileged. And I need to keep that as a barometer for myself and the space that I find myself in and how to be engaged in that leadership role. Mm -hmm. So that's critical for me. Um, and the last point most probably is I want to say leadership takes issues into their own hands. And I, and I want to, 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 to highlight here that, and I often say this in my engagement with, with quite a number of, of international organizations that I work with, is that we have more power than we think we have. And if we can mobilize 28 million nurses around the globe and to take up a leadership role in terms of making an impact into to, um, our system, society, uh, implementing of policies, I mean, it's unstoppable. So I, I often challenge everyone, take up that leadership role within yourself and then collectively, it really becomes a tsunami that, that I believe can just be positive. Uh, thanks so much. Very important um, concepts and ideas there. Um, I want to hand over to Prof. Marty, Marty van der Valt to ask a question. Uh, and I'll just zoom in on her. Thank you. Um, Thank you for taking my question. I want to ask it to Professor Dree, um, Doreen Kaura. We've heard a lot today about um, research and the role of the nurse and the midwife in implementation of that research. Um, so as an organization, the Medical Research Council, we look at the um, efficacy of policy and practice and what are the problems around implementation thereof, but how can the Medical Research Council connect with nurses um, and midwives as they are both the end users of our research, but they are similarly could be participants in our research? Thank you, Prof. Vanderbal, uh, for that question. Nursing and midwifery has really come a long way since the uh, Florence Nightingale and two years down the line around this table are really um, our esteemed colleagues who have done incredible research in, in, within nursing and midwifery. I have been very privileged uh, during this period to engage with SMRC and I can't even um, thank them enough for the collaboration and the support that I have received here to um, plan a webinar like this. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm looking forward to more engagement and uh, one of the things that I'm looking forward to is our next, next uh, engagement series which is research and Professor Klupper will be our guest of honor in that one. She, she didn't know, <laughs> me, like I didn't know that. <laughs> but within nursing and midwifery we really would want to collaborate from the word conceptualization, co-designing of research, implementation. So it's about that space where we can all come together and plan what is going to be done in research. Because what we have realized, apart from being bed, uh, coming from the bedside, is we have the potential of nurses and midwives to engage in evidence-based care or best practice, and that is that is the space that we are going to. So it is a lovely question that you would ask, and um, just 
having engaged with SAMRC, I would look forward to how our department can go forward. I think I'm speaking on behalf of Professor Jordan, she didn't know, but um, how we can go forward and engage with SAMRC in conceptualization, in co-designing, in implementation of that research for best practice. I think this year was meant to do that, exactly that. Just show our leadership, show the excellence that we have in, within nursing and midwifery and showcase that. I know she taught me to grow where I am planted and then she lived by that uh, mantra before I could live by it. But um, I think that is where nurses are going to now um, come on board and we can be co-researchers, we can be co-inventors, we can be um, not just end users but from the beginning we can start thinking about how are we taking healthcare forward. I like what from Grace said, working as a team means that from the beginning we plan how that team is going to go forward, but not just at the end where that team now becomes, we are not the back, we are the backbone, but we can come to the core. And thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. I think uh, we've, uh, we're running out of time. And so I'd just like to summarize uh, some of the discussions that we've had today. I think it's been, uh, oh, sorry, there we go. <laughs> I think uh, we've had some great discussions. Some of the issues that have come up relate to uh, building resilience. Um, how do we uh, strengthen health systems while at the same time working them? Thirdly, the entire issue of leadership and governance. And I think the key things that have come up today is uh, let everyone be a leader, uh, volunteer, and that's where leadership starts, uh, leading without a title, so everyone is a leader, uh, let's lead even if you don't have a title, um, let's uh, also uh, make sure that we work in teams, uh, and let's build teams, so that teams can be the strength of the health system and the strength of the ward, so if every ward has a team and a leader, uh, that's the way the health system will build. And then I also heard issues relating to let's return to, to former practices. You know, COVID has forced us to, for, forced us to return to infection control practices, um, to taking care of each other, taking care of patients. So those are some of the key things that have emerged. Uh, and I thank you, Minister Mbombo and Prof. Ray for the engaging uh, discussions that we've had. And I'd like to thank the regions as well for engaging in the session. I'd like to hand over now to Prof Blitz just to close the webinar for final comments and to close the webinar. Thank you. I just want to echo what a fascinating two hours we've just spent thinking about nursing and midwifery across the three regions of Africa. I think it soon became evident that Healthcare is so much more than care. It is indeed political. It requires positional and non-positional leadership and teamwork and hearing the voices of those we seek to serve. And how necessary it is for all healthcare professionals to be agile in responding to new demands through both the generation of new knowledge and the implementation thereof. So I'd like to just offer a vote of thanks to both the Stellenbosch University Department of Nursing and Midwifery and the South African Medical Research Council for their idea of holding this webinar and the forthcoming webinars um, and the work done to host it successfully. Um, not a mean feat uh, across this continent of ours, so, so thank you. I'd also like to thank Minister Mbombo for making the time I know that the profession is yours and remains close to your heart, but nevertheless, making time in your diary is not so easy. So thank you very much for doing that. And for your team in the Western Cape Department of Health for the support that you've offered in the organization of this webinar. Thank you. Professor Klopper, again, you are and will remain a nurse forever. Um, but thank you very much for your time and for providing the global perspective and key messages on the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife. Prof. Gray, for your support and engagement and continued collaboration. Um, and I think the, the reminder to us all of um, the role that, that nurses and midwives have played um, in our education, and I too speak from 
from the, the doctor side of the equation. Um, but certainly I wouldn't be where I am without the role that, that nurses and midwives have played, not only possibly at my delivery and birth, but in my education as, as a doctor in this country. Um, Prof Amina, thank you for your very effective facilitation of this conversation and summary. And for our participants in the Africa regions, Prof Asiato, Ms. Edna, thank you very much for stepping in at clearly what was the last minute. Um, and, and thank you for your very effective presentation. And at home here, Professor Jordan, thank you very much indeed. I'd like to thank the IT team at the SAMRC for their efficient support in ensuring this online engagement. And of course, the ones that we can't see, and those are the participants who've been following this event, and hopefully those who weren't able to join us live who might actually watch the recording thereof. Um, of course, the person who has pulled us all together, Professor Doreen Kalra. I know she's been waiting for this for months to happen. So thank you very much for this, and thank you for, for being both persistent and perseverant in getting us to this place. Um, in closing, I think I would like to take the opportunity to deeply appreciate all nurses and midwives of all ranks who've worked on the front lines of this pandemic, whether it be in education, prevention, care, palliation, and everything from community care to intensive care, as well as their participation in research. Many of you have done these important jobs while also continuing to care for and protect your loved ones and families. We applaud your courage, compassion, and dedication to patients in whatever role you play and in whichever community that might be. We applaud you for the selfless care that you continue to provide during such difficult times. Our future in the next normal will look different for most healthcare workers. But one thing we do know is that nurses and midwives will continue to be the backbone, the heartbeat, and maybe even the soul of our healthcare systems. We are both proud of you and grateful to you for all that you have done and will continue to do. The world and the region could have not have reached this place with, with, that we have in our response to the pandemic without you. Health is not only about providing care. As I said, it is also political. Please remain advocates for your profession and for excellent patient care. And please keep, keep safe and take care of yourselves so that you may continue to flourish in your really, really important roles. Thank you all for being with us today. Bye-bye.